This is part one of the build slash overview series for the Kyosho Laser ZX5 FS2 SP. That's the latest version of the laser that came out. Um, just to give you a little background as to why I picked this up, uh, I've been racing a, an associated B44.0 for about two years now. And uh, I love that buggy. It's, it's really great. It's very easy to work on. But, you know, I, I want to try something different after two years of running that. I thought about getting a 44.2, which is a longer chassis with big bore shocks and a better slipper clutch. And uh, maybe in the future I will end up getting that. But for the time being, I want to try a different brand of buggy just to see what it's like. Uh, so I picked up the Kyosho Laser. Uh, a couple of my friends at the track uh, do run this and they like it very much. Um, some of the common uh, uh, advantages of Kyosho cars in general that have been touted over other brands is that the parts are higher quality. Uh, the shocks in particular are very smooth and they don't uh, collect as much dirt quite as quickly as other shocks. So the seals are a lot better. Uh, one of my friends that runs a Kyosho RB5 mentioned to me that he would run his shocks for six months on end before replacing the oil. And then when he did, the oil would be a light brown at, at the worst. So uh, I was very, that was very appealing to me because on the B44, which uses the older non big bore shocks, I was replacing the oil every two or three weeks. And even that would be kind of pushing it. You'd really have to do it about every week or so. So, um, I wanted to try something a little different that doesn't require quite so much maintenance and is maybe a little smoother to drive. So, so far I made it up to step 16 of the build for this. Uh, I haven't completed 16, so I really I completed step 15. I just wanted to make a few comments on how this has gone so far and what my impression is of the design of this chassis relative to what I would consider to be the standard bearer of four-wheel drive buggies, the B44 or the B44 series. So as far as the build goes, I think it's important here to separate the build process from the quality of the product. Uh, I do think that the parts are, are a high quality. Uh, I like the use of gunmetal anodized aluminum in uh, all of the metal bits. It's very nice. Uh, the instructions themselves though leave uh, uh, much to be desired. And here's why. So here's all the parts bags and everything. There are different parts bags uh, that are labeled, like this is parts bag number six, maybe a little hard to see, there it is. And there's a whole bunch of them. Now, the parts bags are not organized by step or module necessarily in the build. So if you go through an associated build, they'll have a parts bag for this step and a parts bag for that step. And that's very helpful. Uh, here, you don't have that. It would not be such a big problem if the parts trees themselves were labeled. Okay, so you'll see here, here's one parts tree. None of the parts have any tabs on the side that label each individual part as you would see on say a Tamiya chassis. Okay, so, but the shapes are very recognizable, uh, but that is a bit of a problem because when you go into the manual, for example, oh, let's pick, let's move this over, any old random step here. Uh, here we go. So this is the steering rack, right? So this part of the steering rack is part number 64 and it's in parts bag number two. Okay, fine. Uh, but this actually isn't from parts bag number two. This is on a parts tree. This is from parts bag number one, A and B. If you want to find out what part 64 is, you have to go back to the uh, beginning portion of this manual here. Let's go back a few pages over here, and you have to look for part number 64, which is that guy right there, okay? So then you go to the parts tree, and you look for the part that's on this part of the parts tree, but there's no label on the tree for this number 64, all right? Now, all of these labels here are only for the parts trees in parts bag number one. When you go to parts bag number two, uh, these pieces here are molded parts in parts bag number two, they have numbers associated with them, 338, 309, etc. cetera. Um, these are not only not labeled in their corresponding parts tree in the parts bag, there is no other part of the manual that has a layout of the parts trees in parts bags other than number one 
to show you where on the tree this is. So you have to look on the tree and try to figure out which part it is. For some of these parts, it's not too big a deal. For other parts, it can be a challenge. Also, it does not always tell you which parts are supposed to be gunmetal and which parts are supposed to be molded. So there are parts bags in here that have, uh, you know, parts bags with just metal parts. And so you'll look on here and you say, oh, okay, this is part number blah, blah, blah. But it's not clear whether, uh, if you don't find it, for example, earlier in the manual on that layout, you have to figure out which bag to go to. So that just makes it a little bit of a pain to put everything together. If you're an experienced builder, you can get through it without a big problem. It just takes you more time than it really needs to take you to put everything together. And that's kind of a pain. Uh, another part is sometimes the instructions are not very accurate. So for example, I believe it's this here. Uh, these two screws, these three by eight millimeter uh, uh, button hex screws. It says here that you need parts bags number one and two. Now in parts bag number one, there is a screw bag, but it only contains uh, um, flathead screws, okay? You actually have to go to parts bag number four, which is not here, to get the screw bag that has the button head screws. So in some cases, the instructions are just plain wrong, which means you really have to be careful to double check yourself. So the build process itself, I am not crazy about at all. Um, but nevertheless, it is still a good product. So that's why I wanted to say, you know, it's important to separate the product from the build process. The instructions kind of suck, but the product's nice. Um, having gotten this far, I put together the front suspension, the spur gear slipper clutch, front and rear differentials. And what I can comment on is that the differentials are very nice. They come with tungsten carbide diff balls. They're very smooth when you first build them. Uh, I can say they're certainly better than the associated diffs. When you first build an associated diff, what you do is you tighten it all the way and then back off an eighth of a turn. And they're not bad, but if you build these the same exact way, they feel a lot smoother. Uh, one thing I don't like is the way the slipper clutch goes together. Uh, I can go back to where is it? this part of the manual here. So you have these tiny little slipper pads, which for a modern chassis, I would consider these to be on the small side. Uh, the 44.2 has the VTS slipper, which has a few more slipper pads. Even the B44 had larger area slipper pads here. And you put this whole thing together and uh, basically, if you wanted to replace the spur gear, it's more difficult to do it on this than on a B44. And here's why. The slipper plates that rub against the pad are these two guys here, okay? <clears throat> and these link into a hub, one on this side and one on this side, that, that, that uh, connect to these slipper plates and that's where, where you couple the power through the spur gear to the rest of the drivetrain. These are two separate parts. On the B44, this is a single part on this side and a single part on that side. So if you're gonna take this apart and put it back together, it, it when I first assembled it, it was a bit of a pain to align this slot to this slot and get everything together without this sliding around on the slipper pad. And uh, it was just not fun. Um, if they made this one part here and one part here, it would not only assemble easier, it would also be easier to maintain if for whatever reason you want to swap out the spur gear for a different one, uh, for a different number of teeth, or maybe you strip this one out and you need to replace it. So it's a bit of an operation to replace the spur gear. That's one problem I can see here. Um, let's see. Another problem, if I were to call it that, would be this little piece right here, okay? So this is where you mount the ball studs for the inner camber link. It's a nice little piece and it has different mounting holes for different uh, camber gain adjustments. And you can put a spacer under the ball stud to get a different roll center. That's cool. But the issue here is that, all right, you mount this on the gearbox. And then in order to mount this in, this mounts under the front shock tower. Now, the ball studs that come with the chassis are just conventional ball studs that you screw on with a wrench, like this kind of a wrench. On the associated chassis, the ball studs have a little hole on the top so you can slot in a hex a screwdriver and screw it in from the top. That actually makes it easier on the associated chassis 
to remove this, add a space or subtract a space or do whatever. Here you can't do that, at least with the balsas that came with the chassis. So you have to, in order to readjust to change your camber gain and or roll center, you have to take the, shock, the front shock tower off so that you can fit a wrench in here to remove the ball stud, move it around, do whatever you want. So adjusting the chassis would appear to be a little more difficult on the laser than on the B44. Okay, so for club racing, maybe it's not a big deal because you generally run the factory setup anyway, um, but it is something to note that I would consider this to be um, a bit of a problem when it comes to adjusting the chassis. Uh, the way the suspension arms are mounted is very similar to the Tamiya DB01, where you have, let's just go to this step in the instructions here, you have these little ball type uh, uh, pieces at the end of a hinge pin, and then those go into a cup uh, on the inner mount and the outer mount. So I had commented on this uh, uh, rather venomously on my DB01 review. I don't like the way this is set up. I will admit that an advantage of this approach is that you get less friction in the uh, suspension because the hinge pins can rotate on this, this can rotate on the cup, and the suspension arm can rotate on the hinge pin. So there's more ways in which your suspension arm can move freely, okay? But if you need to change the suspension arm, say you break an arm, uh, it's a bit more of an operation to have to, you know, take an arm out, take all this out, put it all back together, put the new arm in. Okay, so uh, the fix of that, of course, is to drive in a manner that you don't break your arms, but sometimes it's going to be, it's inevitable, you're going to break an arm. Replacing it uh, is more of an operation on this than it would be on a B44, okay? So with the B44 as my standard so far, I would say that the wrenchability of this chassis is not quite as good. And the build experience is clearly a lot worse than on the B44. The B44 instructions are very straightforward. It's a lot easier to put together. You can put it together faster, whether you're an experienced builder or not. Um, but in time, I'll have more of this chassis put together. I will do uh, another video for that. And uh, I, do, I will be driving this for the indoor season, so uh, we'll see how that goes. But so far, it's pretty good. I like the way, you know... It all looks once it's all put together, but I don't think this will be any easier to work on than a B44. Um, but it's interesting nonetheless. So that is what I have for now. And of course, I'll make more videos in the future. So thanks for watching.